we're going to start with this here. This, this is the very, actually, this is not my first window. This is the second window. The first window got destroyed in a, uh, at the studio a few years back, and I, I know there's remains of it somewhere. I haven't found them yet. But this was the actual, the first window was sort of the classroom assignment. I had to build a stained glass window that was one square foot. I had so many lines and I could do, it had to be a certain size and all that. But this was the first window that I designed on my own. And I really haven't grown much further than this. This has everything in it that sort of represents what I do as a glass artist almost 50 years later. Um, the primary goal that I always have when I start out is innovation. What is going to be the next innovation? What is the next new thing that I'm going to do? So in this stained glass window, I decided I wasn't going to be restricted by a rectangle. I wanted to have a, a window that was a different shape. And then I experimented with the different sizes of the leads. Some of the leads are thick, some of the leads are thin. Some of the glass is transparent, some of the glass is color. So all of these ideas, I'm still using those same basic concepts today. And so later, we'll talk about this stained glass window, which we did just a few weeks ago. And so you can see the similarities between it. And we're gonna talk about this one next because it's sort of uh, located in this spot. This is called uh, Two Trees. And it's done with a completely different technique. This is glass painting where I was able to paint onto the surface. I had clove oil and the glass paint mixed into an ink. And I drew the roots and some of the textures and things for the trees. It also represents a symbol for duality, for the positive and negative. We think of male and female, night and day, right and wrong. So duality, and when I was early on in my career as an artist, I was interested in a real range of different spiritual traditions, you know. So um, I was experimenting, and it took, me, it took a while to kind of come into the realm of Christianity and to take Christianity on is my own life uh, story. But in the beginning, I was kind of all over the map. And um, so the idea of duality and the use of nature, the nature themes are so prevalent in all the work that I do. One of the earliest traditions that I studied was the, uh, the Tao, the Tao tradition, which is from the Chinese and there was a man that left uh, Lao Tse, left a book called the uh, Tao Te Ching, which is like 88 chapters. And when I was on a bus trip in college, during the time when I was making the small stained glass window, we went on a bus trip to California. I was in a bookstore in Berkeley, California, and bought this book, the Tao Te Ching. And I bet I've read it 100 times. And it, it's really all about the physical forces of nature and how, as human beings, we're linked into that, to what we experience on the earth and in the earth. And so that imbued me with a lot of ideas and things in the very beginning. And one of them, of course, is duality. And this is also experimental because it doesn't have any lead work. It's just enamels. There's more than one layer of glass. I think there's at least two or three layers of glass, and each layer has different uh, paints on it. And I was using a uh, gold, a red gold uh, enamel, and I learned that when I built up the enamel, it turned to this really beautiful red, but when it was thin, it turned into this beautiful gold. So there was always experiment going on in my work. I mean, I've always uh, kind of wanted things to blow up so that I could learn from those mistakes. You know, being in the South, 
it's all about telling a story. If you don't have a story to tell, stay home. You know, if you're not going to be interesting, you know, don't. So when I, this was like very early on, probably two or three years after I had been in the studio and I developed a friendship with a woman who lived in Yazoo City. And so I would drive from Jackson to Yazoo City. One Saturday morning, I was on my way up there and I had this old raggedy pickup truck and this red winged blackbird, you know how birds fly, you know, they'll, they fly and then they kind of swoop, you know, they'll, they'll kind of pause and they'll go this way, that way. And so what happened was I looked up and the red winged blackbird had paused right at the second that I looked and it created this silhouette. And then I pulled over to the side of the road and then I did a sketch of the bird. And then later, my friend in Yazoo City wanted me to make a stained glass window for her. She commissioned me to do a stained glass window. So I wanted to, I did the red winged blackbird and, and you can see in this that it's got that innovation uh, tradition in it. It's got these uh, curvilinear lines which sort of harken back to that very first window. The beauty of uh, uh, curved lines, those arcs, and then the lead work. Uh, there's some interesting uh, deviations from the ideas about how to use lead work. And then uh, the drawing and the, the is a very simple graphic. And what I've done over the entire 45 years that I've been working with glass, I've gone back and used the bird over and over again. Matter of fact, I'm looking around here and I see the bird popping up in some different places. You can see the bird in that cross piece. That's actually a, an ascending bird for a cross piece. And then there's another bird behind that figure over there. So I would go back and use the bird over and over again. Whenever I was going to try something new, a new experimental technique, I would go back and use the bird because it was a form that I was familiar with. And so the red winged blackbird um, has been sort of my avatar from the very uh, beginning. This is a very pivotal image for me. I've always been a painter and when I went off to college, I wanted to be an artist, but I studied landscape architecture because I wanted to study something that I felt was gonna be more like a job instead of trying to make a living as an artist. I didn't think that was really viable at the time, so I studied landscape architecture, which I have a great respect for because I learned a lot about design and process. And so early on, my paintings were very personal, uh, sort of uh, gestural uh, constructions and paintings and feelings and emotions. And, you know, I was really just uh, painting more as an exercise. And so what I did was I saved a lot of paintings on paper. I worked primarily on paper. And then I took some painting parts and tore them apart, tore them apart, and then I glued them back down, and then I made a new painting from the collage pieces. And why that's, why that's influential in terms of my entire career as an artist is that I went from making art as this, as this uh, explosion of feeling and emotion, and then I realized that actually paintings were design. It was a design and not just an emotion. So this taught me that I could start to approach painting like I approached my stained glass work in terms of it being a design, in terms of design elements and textures and line and form and composition, all those things that were taught as art students, then uh, you know, it really changed the way that I thought about uh, doing composition and about artwork. And it's also influential because it influenced the stained glass too, because stained glass is all about shape and uh, design. And so this was sort of a stained glass quality in terms of design because it was taking 
the pieces from the collages and tearing them up and gluing them back down again, which was a, uh, a piece kind of thing. So let's fast forward from all that experiment with the dial and other different, all kinds of experimentations with spirituality and, you know, just trying to understand what that dynamic was and how it was going to influence me as an artist and how I pursued my career. But it took a few years, but it dawned on me that I was going to be doing stained glass windows for churches, right? Because stained glass windows belong in churches. That's the tradition. That's where the leaded glass windows go. That's where the business was going to go, was towards uh, being a provider for the Christian church in terms of doing artwork. And so I'm a very practical and logical person, I like to think that I am. And I thought, well, you know, it would really be smart to take Christianity and become more engaged with Christian traditions. And then I got married and it's when I was 45 years old and my wife and I uh, started to go to St. Collins Episcopal Church because I wanted to base my marriage on a tradition, a family, a church family to, work, to depend on to. And so to have that tradition as part of our life as a family, we had two children, we baptized them in the church. Uh, the Christian church has a very deep, long tradition as far as a mystical tradition. You know, the, well, I guess one of the er, easiest ones to think about is uh, St. Francis of Assisi. St. Francis of Assisi, you know, had uh, revelations. Uh, he experienced stigmata. Um, he was very influential in the life of the Catholic Church. And a lot of mystery and grows out of the story of, of St. Francis. And we did a beautiful project for a Catholic church in Madison, Mississippi for St. Francis of Assisi. And so I got interested in icon writing. And icon writing is part of the Orthodox Church that goes all the way back to the time of Christ. In the tradition of iconography, then we copy design over and over again and try to imbue the writing of an icon with prayer and you know, spiritual discernment that you're going through while you're writing the icon. They talk about it as writing an icon and not paint, painting an icon because you are, it's like a liturgy. It's, it's a liturgical enterprise where you are contemplating the saint that you're rendering in the icon. The tradition for that goes all the way back to the Egyptians. The Egyptians painted wooden plaques of faces. When people would die, they would paint portraits, the faience, I think is what it's called, and then they would have these portraits, and that was kind of a funeral rite. So there were portraits painted with egg tempera. And that tradition grew into iconography. And so part of the tradition of Christian iconography is that the early desert fathers painted pictures of Jesus and Mary and the saints and they would use these pictures when they went around as visual aids, much like I'm doing now, to talk about the story of the gospel. And they would use these pictures. And so that tradition continues all the way to today in the Orthodox traditions in Europe, primarily Eastern Europe. The man that I studied with was a Russian iconographer, Vladislav Andreev, who started iconography when he was in Russia during the communist rule and then came to the United States and started teaching iconography. So, you know, I feel like I'm part of that tradition. I'm saying all of this because what my logic behind this was that 
if I was going to be an artist that worked in the Christian church, if I was going to be making religious objects, these are going to be stained glass windows that go into a church environment, they're going to be revered, they're going to be worshipped along with as people were in a service and they're there for reconciliation, redemption, you know, they're there for a reason when they come to church. And so the stained glass windows are a backdrop. And so if I was going to do that, I wanted to feel like I was giving the most that I possibly could to that enterprise because of how important it was. And so the only tradition that I know of that exists that has any lineage back to the time of Christ is iconography because they can say in prayers as part of the iconographer prayer mentions that there is an icon that was painted of Jesus and then that icon was copied over and over again. So the, the tradition in iconography is that you're not creating anything new but you're copying what's gone on from before so that you're part of this long-standing tradition so I studied iconography for probably 15 years. I would go one week a year for about 15 years. And then, you know, I'm not orthodox in the sense that I'm using the icons to revere the icons and then all of the traditions that go along with that. That's not really, that wasn't really my motive so much was learning the discernment of working on small artwork. When I go to church, I'm always a doodler. You know, I cannot, you know, I'm always sketching. I'm always doodling. That's what artists do, they doodle. I've got a, a bunch of sketchbooks that when we uh, have our second and final presentation this afternoon after lunch, I've got all my sketchbooks and I thought I would share sketchbooks and you can look through there and kind of see how I explore and design. So these are uh, a project that I, have been working on, when I go to church, you know, you get a surface leaflet where you can follow along what hymns and what the scriptures are going to be read and whatnot. So these are sketches that I've done while I'm sitting in the pew, and they represent, it's, you know, when, um, you know, the, the concept of prayer and meditation, right? Okay, so when you when you're ready to pray, you try to find or meditate, then you are finding a quiet place. You try to vacate your mind. You try to empty your mind in order to be able to receive whatever is going to be given to you in terms of spiritual information or tradition. So when I'm at church then, and we're going through the service, and I'm re we're listening to the Old Testament and the New Testament readings, then I'll just sketch whatever kind of comes into my head, right? So, so this is just research. You know, I'm not, there is no intention other than just sitting there and trying to listen to the Scripture and find out what inspiration that gives me. So... When I'm doing design for stained glass windows for the Christian church, then there's this uh, experience that I want to recreate. It's part of that discernment from the icon writing, the tradition of icon writing that I've learned, and then I try to get into that frame of mind of discernment. And then I try to open my mind like a meditation and a prayer so that I can, uh, you know, God continues to speak to us. It's not, you know, they didn't write the Bible and all of a sudden God quit talking to us, right? I like to believe that. So then if I'm in the right frame of mind and I have the right discernment, then I'm able to bring to this process something of value, and, uh, and it means something to me, and then it also creates something that means uh, something to the people that get the chance to view the stained glass windows. And some of these are kind of fun. Um, 
they're just, you can look at them, and I didn't copy the scripture or the scripture references on all of them, but uh, I think this was the one where it's sort of like God is, is the potter, the, the analogy of God is the potter, and then you see all these little people marching around. I think this is Mary and, and Joseph here, and, and uh, these look like the disciples and at the Last Supper. Um, so uh, some of them are interesting. This is uh, the prodigal son, would be my guess what this one is. And then here's little Egyptian pyramids in the background. Uh, so, oh, this is fun. So I have uh, Jesus when he's at, you know, the temple and the money changers, that whole story about him going in and throwing the tables up and everything. So I've got him, you know, changing coins there and everything. Here's somebody on a noose on a telephone pole. I'm not sure exactly what that means. But uh, so anyway, it was just an, uh, part of the idea of uh, Christian formation, you know, that you're, you're engaged with your religion and it can be expressed in so many different ways. So part of my tradition in, in my life was my, my grandmother. And my grandmother was uh, just, you know, one of those brilliant uh, persons. She was, uh, she was Baptist. She taught Bibles. Uh, she taught uh, Sunday school classes. But she was also interested in religion. She was also interested in comparative religions. I have books where she had written about the sevenfold path of Buddha, and she was writing notes in her in the margins of her books. And when she passed away, I was, I, was, I was a young teen, I was a teenager, maybe 13, 14 years old. And so I hadn't really developed my own intellectual life. And so I never really got to speak to her on matters of great import, you know, about religion and spirituality and all of that. So, uh, but I do know that she had this great uh, life as a spiritual seeker, she was supportive of the Baha'i movement. The Baha'i movement is, uh, was started in Iran well over a century ago. It was a father and son that developed uh, the Baha'i traditions. There's a beautiful temple in Evanston, Illinois. If you're ever in Evanston, Illinois, the Baha'i temple there is just a remarkable structure. And so my grandmother was involved with supporting them. She worked in their office here in Jackson. And I remember as a little child going into the office because everything was really low, right? So I know it was me because I was a little short. And so we would take sandwiches down there. And coincidentally, uh, many, 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 many years later, I rented an apartment that was right next door to the office where she worked. And so there was this connection, and the building has long since been torn down, but I lived downtown in Jackson for five years. I was kind of the first artist pioneer, artist studio downtown Jackson. This would have been about, oh gosh, 1985, I guess it was, 85 to 90. And so... This is another one of those innovations. I'm always interested in uh, process and, and finding new ways to combine things. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick this up. And so these, it's like a book. All right, so this is a, uh, it's a wooden frame. And inside the wooden frame is a groove. And I painted on the art glass. And I was able to silicone that up in there to make it permanent. So I've had this. And my cats have not ruined this yet. Uh, it's been in this place up there, and I was looking at it the other day, and I was thinking, you know, you need to just go ahead and get that down before they break it, because I've got one cat that just is just really adventuresome. So my grandmother, uh, Granny, Stevie Flynn, and she traveled to Europe. So in the background, I've got a, this is Spain. She was in Spain. She got sick in Spain. And then she had some friends there and she had to recuperate. And then she came back to the United States and brought all these beautiful slide photographs of Europe. You know, back then they had these great 
uh, color slides and we'd have slide projectors and we would look at pictures. It was really kind of a lovely thing. And this was part of her story was the trip to Europe was a big event after she had retired and came home and she wanted to go back to the Holy Land but was never able to go. And then I need to go to the Holy Land for her now that I think about it. So this is my mother. This is Carrie Nell. She's it's one of those uh, two name names, you know, it's a Southern thing, Carrie Nell. And so she was a gardener. And so there's, this was from a photograph that my father took of her. And so there's plants and gardening stuff that's going on in the background. And so it's uh, the glass painting tradition of, uh, of stained glass. And now that I'm looking at this thing, I know what this was, the innovation in this. I'm always innovating. I'm always trying to come up with some new way of doing things. It just keeps me interested in it. So I took a piece of screen, you know, like a s aluminum screen that you would have, your, like a screen door. Okay. So I took metal screen and I cut it out into the shape of Spain and Italy and Europe and then I put that down onto the glass and then I sandblasted it. And so it uh, created a relief of that design using the screen. And then over here on my mother's side, I remember this now, this is, uh, I think this is cattails and this is uh, pampas grass and different plant materials that I glued to the back of the material of, of the glass, then sandblasted it and then came back and uh, rubbed paint and everything into it. So um, that is the tradition of um, the little icon that I made. And I guess my biggest criticism of this, I've always, it's always like the focal point is the hinge. And so I did, a, I did probably six or seven of these. A few of them have survived but I never really quite thought that it was perfect. You know, it's always kind of like you're really looking at the hinge and not the artwork. And so it was just one of those ideas that kind of came and went. Um, in honor of my grandmother, I am going to read a poem. And so as an artist, you know, a lot of artists have been poets. Uh, William Blake, I guess, would be the most famous one that we could reference. And then... Um, Khalil Gibran is also a wonderful poet and a great artist in his own right. And so a lot of artists, I know that uh, I'm going to drop Michelangelo's name, why not? So Michelangelo wrote sonnets, you know, and, and so a lot of artists, visual artists have been poets because it's, it's language, right? And so what we are doing is we're communicating with symbols. Language is a very complicated and uh, symbol. We talked, to, Addison and I talked about this yesterday. We were on a field trip. We talked about how language is our operating system. You know, language is how we think. It's how we learn. It's how we communicate. It's how we um, make contracts. Uh, so the way we use language is instrumental to how we are human beings. And so as an artist and a creative person, you know, I'm just interested in one more way to express myself, and that is through language. And I chose this poem because it kind of references my grandmother in the poem. So I'm going to read it. It's called uh, Cobbler Knowledge. And the reason I wrote this was because the famous poet uh, Dylan Thomas wrote a lot of poems about his own childhood and a friend of mine shared a recording of his poetry and I listened to it and he wrote poems about his childhood and I thought that I would do the same and uh, write a poem about my childhood. It's called Cobbler Knowledge. Sunshine so bright that shadows disappear. What did we do when the summer stretched on forever? What creek was safe from our engineering prowess? 
What did fish think that succumbed to the taste of grimy worms pilfered from my mom's compost pile? Creatures large and small would escape our marauding plunder, the old farm with implements strewn asunder, would only make us wonder about a past that could have hardly mattered to our youthful present myopia, creating a utopia that could only last forever. From the edge of the bramble, we collected blackberries and chiggers to take home to the granny with cobbler knowledge and skills so admired decades later. Then the mystery of wheels attached to mowers, bikes, and automobiles on which we rode out into distant adventures. It was time to test stupidity against the laws of physics to survive with eyes, fingers, and bones unbroken, pressing hard against the future with all that youthful vigor. So we're going to talk about the stained glass windows next and end up with a presentation about those exhibition panels. We'll talk about that last. So these were done 20 years ago. I looked at the dates. I did a whole series of these in uh, 2001, and it's been 20 years uh, between these art pieces and those art pieces. We'll talk about it in the end, the Bird's Nest series over there. Uh, the in-between was when my daughter was born in 2000 and my son was born in 2001. So I think that that 20-year hiatus was me running the business, raising a family, and now I've got time and energy to put back into making uh, exhibition panels like this. But this one has a family story too, because one of the things that I think is important as an artist is how do you find inspiration? Where do, you, where do your ideas come from? So this was a drawing that I had done originally during a trip to North Carolina my wife and mother of my children, my ex-wife, her sister lives in North Carolina and they were having a baptism for her firstborn child and it was Easter. So I stayed at home with my, with uh, my father-in-law because we were cooking a roast for Easter, right? And so while I was there, I did a real detailed watercolor sketch of the Easter lilies that were there for the uh, family dinner and all for the baptism and also for Easter. So I'm always challenging myself. I just wanted to see just how realistic I could render that uh, drawing and watercolor that I did. I looked around a little bit before I came over and I wasn't lucky I didn't find the original sketches. Maybe I'll get Gretchen to share those with y'all later if I can find them. They're in a sketchbook somewhere. So this is glass painting and what glass painting is a part of the tradition of stained glass windows going all the way back to the very earliest windows. Even a thousand years ago, the earliest stained glass windows had painting on the surface and the glass was fired in a kiln to make it permanent. So in, stain, in the tradition of stained glass, this idea of uh, an enamel, basically this is a lot of like uh, a ceramic artist would have a pot and clay and they're gonna put a glaze on it. It's the same idea. A glaze, a coffee mug has glass on the outside, right? It's, uh, a glaze is silica that heats at 2300 degrees, it melts and it covers the ceramics plates mugs, whatever, with a, a layer, a thin layer of glass. A lot of that is what's happening here is that this is a thin glaze put onto the glass and fired in a kiln. And then you have different rendering techniques. You apply the glass, you take the paint off, you put more glass painting on there. That was one of the experiments that I was working on with the uh, family icon over there. So uh, learning all about the different traditions and techniques in stained glass. 
was part of the idea behind Pearl River Glass Studio, the company from the very beginning, was that if we were gonna be artists in glass, we wanted to know all the possible techniques that were at our disposal. So early on, it was glass painting and firing in the kiln. And then this is, uh, uses a technique that we utilized a lot at the very beginning and that is uh, acid etching. So this is actually, when I started with this, this was a full sheet of red. I took beeswax, melted beeswax, and dripped it onto the surface. And then I dipped this into hydrofluoric acid and it ate away the red layer and exposed the clear glass underneath and then I etched it for a little while and came back and added more beeswax on top. So I'm able to get uh, various uh, tones. It's a very unique uh, artistic technique in stained glass and I just love acid etching. And we, you did a lot of it until fused glass came along and we started doing a lot more of the work with the uh, fused glass because it just opened up a whole new area of expression. This is, I put uh, Elmer's glue, I painted little splotches of Elmer's glue onto the surface of the glass and then I deep carved it with sandblasting because this glass right here, this was intended to be, uh, the title of this piece is Pompeii. Okay, Pompeii. So we're thinking of uh, lava, and this is the mosa Italian mosaics along the floors, let's say. And so, so this the idea was the, the 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 flow of lava, the fire, the mosaics. All of that was kind of my idea, and you can see the the extended lead works uh, idea of uh, incorporating some design with the lead work. And so I have uh, this has been fire polished. One of the techniques that you can do with Sandblasting is that you can sandblast the surface, which creates this very porous surface, but then when you fire it in the kiln to the same temperature that you're firing the glass painting, it polishes the surface. So these are all things that we learned as we did. You know, we would experiment, we're always innovating, trying new techniques and things, and we learned and added to our repertoire as artists in glass by experimentation and innovation as it went uh, through. And uh, as a matter of fact, one of the innovations here is that the, uh, so that the, there's a stainless steel, <laughs> I'm laughing because, okay, so this is stainless steel cable, which is seven strands of seven wires. There's 49 little baby wires that run twisted together, comes down through here and back up around over here. And this channel is hollow. So see, I'm able to, uh, to adjust this thing to make it look level. It's always, always adjustable. So it's uh, one of those innovations. I'm always interested in presentation and how to figure out how to make things work. And so that was always one of my favorites was the hidden cable in the, uh, in the leaded glass. And so this one is based on a quilt. So it's, a, it's the quilt theme and I use the glass painting, which is fired in the kiln and there's also silver stain, which creates, silver stain is this yellow uh, technique. It was invented in the 13th century as far as the history of stained glass is concerned. It's silver nitrate in a clay body and is painted onto the surface when you fire this to about 1200 degrees, 1100 degrees, it changes the ionization of the glass yellow. So it's the only thing that we really do as a stained glass artist that can change the nature of the materials that we use. And then there's fused glass, which was a modern invention. The fused glass may have to be a different um, master class altogether, because we're kind of talking about leaded stained glass this time. So. This is symbols that I created. So these are clouds, these are the sun, these are ladders, and then uh, this is water. 
So I tried to create symbols for the different elements of fire, water, sky, air, and then um, brought in ladders, because I think there's something about uh, ladders that are kind of cool. So this thing is a repetition of pattern. Pattern is a very important part of what an artist has at their disposal in terms of communication. It's, you know, people are fascinated by pattern, and so whenever you incorporate pattern into your work, then you're engaging people, kind of like uh, moths to a flame. So here's the bird, all right? Remember the, remember the bird from the very beginning. The bird's always showing up. All right, so this is my, <laughs> I, really, I really am just, just shy of crazy. Okay, so, uh, so, so you can hang this on the wall. See, it's got a little hole in it. It's a piece of, it's a piece of plywood with lots of plywood lying around. And so, so I have design renderings that, you know, I hate to throw anything away. One thing about being from Mississippi is that we don't throw anything away, right? Because you might use it. You might find something else to use it for later. I mean, don't throw anything away. So, yeah, she knows exactly what I'm talking about. So I got all these pieces of wood and whatnot. So anyway, so the idea here, see, this is, this is great. So you have a little thing that makes a little foot and it, so it can stand here. Anyway, we'll sit around. So this was an early adapter. I think I had to come back and do this one again because this is one of the early ones. But uh, you're welcome to steal this idea. Uh, you got to have a bandsaw. I think it could probably be, be done differently. What is it about latex paint that sticks to latex paint? What is it about that? Anyway, they're just kind of annoying. But anyway, so uh, these are renderings that I would have done for stained glass commissions, and then I would take the renderings and I would glue them down, going back to the early collage, as collage process has become part of what I do. And so I'm collaging these little renderings down, and then I'm taking found materials like cloth and gluing it down. I think this was a, a larger painting that I had glued some clothes to with Elmer's glue, and they came back and painted it. And I came back and cut it up into different size chunks. And so this is kind of a remnant from an earlier artwork that I had kind of recycled. And so one of the things that I'm always, I love working with watercolor because it's quick and it dries and it's uh, transparent because the glass is transparent. So the watercolor media that I paint with is transparent. So it, there's a similarity between the glass and the painting medium that I'm doing for making renderings. And so I have all kinds of fun techniques and stuff that I've sort of uh, done over the years. I think what happened on this one was that uh, somehow or another it got rained on, and then I really liked it with the rain on it because it kind of made it, uh, give it that sort of look. I'm not sure if that was intentional. I think that was accidental, but I liked it anyway. And, uh, and so these were the little uh, rendering sit-around things. So this represents the same idea, just larger. So back 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I would work a lot of my designs full size. I wanted to become more familiar with the scale of the artwork and how big things needed to be to be in scale. Because it's really important when you're doing commission work that it looks right, that it fits the building, fits the environment. And so I'm always working full size to make sure I get my scale issues and everything worked out. So now I've got all of these drawings rolled up from these large scale drawings and I'm trying to figure out what to do with them. I have one idea about turning them into placemats, you know, for dinner tables, but I haven't worked all the way out of yet. I'm working on that one. That's what we're gonna, Addison and I are gonna work on that. Uh, so I took a, a large scale painting, I tore it apart, and now I've got these new design elements and I glued it all back together again. And so this is just a, a piece of plywood, um, I think it was probably a piece of plywood that had some paintings and things on it from the beginning. Uh, I love uh, sheetrock and spackling because it kind of creates all these different textures. And one of the demonstrations we're gonna do later is I'm gonna come back and paint some watercolor on here and you'll see how the watercolor will create a different kind of pattern which sort of goes back to some of the concept of the iconography traditions that I studied. So. We're going to use this later as a uh, demonstration for painting, but it's also showing how um, 
you know, you have an idea and then it's changed and now it's something new. So there's a kind of redemption in it, I think, uh, in how we do the, the artwork. What happened here was Gretchen said, uh, why don't you come and do our artist master class? And I said, I would love to. She said, and I'm familiar with the gallery. So I thought about the gallery and uh, a friend of mine that used to work at the studio left behind these beautiful mahogany wooden frames. So I thought I would fill them up with some art glass. And then I thought about, I've been wanting to do some large drawings. And so I used this as an excuse to do these, this large drawing over here. And then we're gonna do that as part of my demonstration after lunch. And so you can see here the, uh, the lead work, the different sizes of lead that was instrumental from the very, very beginning of the interest of the lead and the line weight. So I was interested in the line, but then I wanted to use clear textured glasses. These are all commercially available <clears throat> clear glasses. They all have different textures on the surface. And then I wanted to put the glass paint that goes all the way back to the earliest traditions of stained glass. And I applied the glass paint to the textures and it kind of just painted itself. I mean, I painted the glass paint on there. I came back with my fingers and rubbed some of it off and it revealed this interesting textures. So it was actually, it probably took me 30 minutes to paint each one of these once the glass was all cut and ready to go. It was just really quick. It was just an idea. And so that's where the, the original, one of the great things about working full size is, is, is it's physical. You know, it's very, 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 uh, you know, you're, you're physically in the uh, moment of working and you're physically drawing where the lead lines will go. And so there's this meditation that I get to enjoy by doing that. And then I came back and drew on top of it. I must have sprayed this with something because it's not too messy. But I know these are the originals and not copies. And so the ink is all bristled up and everything. So I'm kind of wandering here, I'm sorry. But Bird's Nest was the idea and so I tried to capture the feeling of all the little sticks. And then there was this kind of fuzziness in the bird's nest. And I wish that I had brought my bird's nest with me to use as a visual aid, but you'll just have to imagine it. So then, so it's my imagination trying to recreate a physical object. And so it turned it into this, you know, lead and glass and texture and, and all of that. So. Now I have ideas about doing a series of windows using the clear textured glasses and all of that. Let's bring forward the idea of innovation again. This is some of that textured clear glass. And we were talking about the textured clears over here. We had a bunch of textured clear glass left over. I, I hate to throw anything away. We've already had that theme. And so I wanted to recombine the clear textured glasses just to kind of see what would happen so Addison helped me. She cut all this glass. Addison made this. And uh, she cut all the glass. We, we put it together in the kiln and we melted it. So this is fused glass. So we're taking glass, we're melting it together to make a new object. And it's different than leaded stained glass windows because of this heat process that you go through. So, you know, the after Get this on here. Okay. So after World War II, in the United States, there was a, a lot of interest in the crafts on college level art departments were bringing clay. And one of the things that they were able to do, Alfred University, uh, I think Michigan State, Ohio State, some of those Midwestern schools brought glass manufacturing down to the studio level, the artist's studio level. It's the artist's 
American art studio movement in glass. And so that grew into, uh, in the early part of the 1970s, they started experimenting with manufacturing opalescent glasses of different types and techniques. We talked about Tiffany a little bit. Have we talked about Tiffany? Hasn't mentioned his name yet. So, you know, Tiffany did a lot of experimentation with different types of manufacturing processes with glass. And then we bring that forward to after World War II and they started to make making glass an art studio possibility. And then the people in Oregon, primarily Portland, started to manufacture glass as reproductions of glass to repair lampshades or to make reproductions of Tiffany style stained glass windows. And so that process led to making a range of glass of color that you can melt together called fused glass. And these are designs for a commission that we did here in the Jackson area for Beth Israel Congregation out on Old Canton Road. And they commissioned me to do a Holocaust Memorial Garden. And it was quite an experience for me because most of the traditions that I had followed in terms of symbolism and imagery was related to the Christian church because of the background of stained glass. And so the, telling the story of the Holocaust was a great challenge because of the history involved with, you know, millions of people were, were killed by the Nazi regime. And so I took that story of the Holocaust and broke it down into seven chapters. So each one of the sculpture pieces, these represent renderings of sculptures that are twice this size. So these are like half size renderings of the actual artwork. And today, if you got in your car and drove out to Beth Israel Congregation, you could drive behind the church and there in the garden are these sculptures. They're open 24-7, 365. There's no fence or anything. It's just open. So you can go and see these today if you'd like. So we'll talk about some of the different uh, symbols and images that are in there. So what I wanted to do with the renderings was to try to create a painting that I knew that I could translate into glass. And so I have this bold brush stroke, which represents uh, small pieces of the colored fused glass. Each one of the totems, each one of the seven sculptures is on a concrete column. And the concrete column goes underground 10 feet with a piling. And then all seven sculptures are connected with a grade beam. There's like 35,000 pounds of concrete underground to support these things because in Mississippi we have hurricanes, right? And so an architect, when an architect designed a, designs a building, they have to engineer it for sustained 90 mile an hour winds. And so when I did the design for the sculptures, I took my designs, gave it to an engineer, and he told us how big everything and how strong everything had to be in order for these to stand up to hurricane wind loads. So it was a beautiful idea, but it also had to be engineered. I mean, you know, if I'm going to put artwork in where public is going to be exposed to it, then I need to be really careful about engineering to make sure that it's all going to stand up over a period of time. So that was part of it. And there was a, a one of the members was a survivor of the Holocaust at Beth Israel Congregation, a Mr. Metz, who has passed away. But his number, you know, when, they, when, when, when the uh, people were in the concentration camps, they were given a serial number, and his serial number was 184203. So each one of the sculptures has one of the numbers of his, um, let's see, for me one that's going to be pretty obvious here somewhere. 
oh, there's number four. That's right there in the lower part. So there's a four. They're not in order here. So we put the serial number in the design of the windows. And I can kind of go around and talk about the different stories. This one is the uh, book burning. One of the laws that was passed by the Nazi regime at the time was that any books that were written by Jews had to be destroyed. So there was an, a, a night where books were thrown into the middle of the squares and the small villages and towns, and then books written by Jews were destroyed. And so this was one of the very first uh, events leading up to the Holocaust. And then this is the uh, menorah, which is the uh, seven or nine, it can be seven or nine uh, candlesticks and a lot of stories about menorahs that had survived uh, through the Holocaust. So the menorah is also part of the, it's like our cross in the Christian church. So I wanted to depict a symbol that was very familiar to the people of the congregation. This one is a uh, crystal knocked. Crystal knocked was a night when there were riots. The Nazi supporters and the Nazis would go through the towns and broke all of the store windows of Jewish merchants. And so it's called crystal knocked. So it's all about the crystal, the night that the crystal was all broken, the stores were all broken. Uh, and damaged. This image here is called um, the ghetto. So it represents architectural structures and bricks. And so it's, uh, that was one of the first things that happened was that the Jews were all brought together in these towns in very small neighborhoods, the ghettos, where they could be controlled, and, um, and then later when they were put on trains to take out to the concentration camps, they knew where they all were, right? So then this one, we're going to end up with this one. This one to me was the most, uh, the, the story that always got to me the most, and it was the one about the killing brigades. They started out by getting small army groups, brigades, to go into villages and kill people. They would, it would destroy an entire village, the, everybody, everything, all the culture, the traditions of family and cooking and crafts and stories and all of that were destroyed. And the Jews were not being killed fast enough. And that's when they created the concentration camps. They wanted to have a much more efficient system. And so they created the, the, the uh, concentration camps. So this is the story. It's called Disappearing Village. And in the window, there are some human forms. And it's kind of like they're just a, a disappearing in the image. So it was a very sobering uh, story. And it was a very sobering experience for me to be able to you know, communicate these ideas to make these monumental sculptures, to have them in place, um, designed to withstand hurricanes and storms. And now there's a place that is a living memory of that story so that we don't create that thing again. The reason I wanted to end on this was that as an artist, you are oftentimes called to do significant things. And so, you know, you want to have the skill and the ability and um, the creativity, the innovation to be able to, to meet challenges in a career is really what I feel like I've done, uh, especially the last year with the COVID situation has been uh, the ultimate challenge as far as business is concerned. But aesthetically, we're doing great. We're making beautiful work, and we continue to do so. Um, it's just that the business aspects of it sometimes are the most challenging.